Metallica drummer Lars Ulrich has had his share of feuds over the band's 40-year history, and today we're going to take a look at a handful of them. Despite both emerging out of Los Angeles in the early 80s, Motley Crue and Metallica were not part of the same circles, and by Ulrich and frontman James Hetfield's own admission, they used their distaste for the glam and hair metal scenes to drive their determination. It was 1982 and Motley Crue had just put out Too Fast for Love. I remember one night out in front of the Troubadour, we're standing there in our Iron Maiden t-shirts and it was like, after a couple of, you know, cold sort of Schlitz malt liquors or whatever, it was like, you saw you like Nikki and Tom, it was like, Motley Crue, I remember like Nikki Six started chasing after me and the one thing I could do, because you know, five foot six of me, I could like run faster than he could in his 16 inch platform boots, so it, was, it wasn't a contest there. <laughs> L.A. just didn't treat us well. We had this aggressive style, and I recall at the Troubadour, there was a security guy throwing chairs at us, you know, at sound check, going, get out of here, you punks. You know, they thought we were punk rock, you know? We'd be up on stage playing, and people were fluffing their hair over at the bar. And that's not what music was for us. We're going to play louder. We're going to play faster. We want some attention. The War of Words wouldn't resurface until 1997, when Ulrich criticized Molly Crew for playing using a backing track during an appearance at the American Music Awards. Crew bassist Nikki Six responded, putting out an open letter on an online forum saying, Dear sweet fat balding Lars, love the makeup babe. Taking your ever moronic soapbox position on a subject that's none of your business has made you out to be an expletive as usual, considering that I and Tommy know that your live tapes have been pre-recorded and all your instruments were repaired in Pro Tools and then had to lie to your fans and call it a live album. People in glass houses should not throw rocks. Considering your BS to the press, we feel it only fair to return the punch. You're such a poser. Thanks for releasing that load of expletive CD of yours. You made more room for us. Unfortunately for the crew, their new album that came out the same year, their first with Vince Neil in nearly eight years, Generation Swine, was both a commercial and critical flop. The feud, however, seemed to die down within a few years as Six defended Metallica's album St. Anger against angry fan reaction and praised the band's dedication to their live shows during a 2015 interview reminiscing of the time both bands shared a festival bill. Metallica's ex-bassist Jason Newstead would leave Metallica in 2001. And despite his side project Echo Brain being hailed as the main culprit for his departure, there was an incident that foreshadowed him leaving the group in the early 90s. This year, Newstead, during an interview with Metal Hammer, revealed, and I quote, I just established the Chop House Studio in 92, and by 94 we had all the gear. Devin came to town at the age of about 22 and was an absolute maniac. Every time he would pick up the guitar, you'd get whittle, 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 and you're like, dude, where in the hell did that come from? Now play it backwards. It would result in a six-track demo with Newstead adding, the guys got wind of it, referring to his bandmates in Metallica, and Lars said, you gotta come up to the house, and I didn't really know what it was for, so I take my bass and go up there. What's up, guys? Dude, you know you're in Metallica now, don't you? You just can't be sending out tapes to whatever expletive with whichever expletive. You do understand that, right? Newstead would respond saying that he didn't realize it at all and didn't think it was a big deal. Adding, I was just sharing some metal with my friends. Pretty much broke down that day in front of Lars and James. I was like, I'm sorry, it won't happen again. Ulrich would tell Zane Lowe in 2021, if you think about it, Jason is the only member of Metallica who's ever left willingly, and that in itself is a statistic. And the resentment from James and I was just so, you can't do that. You can only leave if you want to leave. And then we weren't equipped at the time to go in a deep dive into why he was leaving. Of course, now you can see 20 years later, it makes complete sense. Guns N' Roses and Metallica would tour together in 1992 as part of a co-headlining stadium tour across North America. The tour was fraught with problems, including cancellations and a riot that broke out in Montreal that was mostly blamed on Guns N' Roses frontman Axl Rose. Guns N' Roses on that tour blew 80% of their income going on stage late night after night, paying fines and overtime to their staff, and throwing extravagant backstage parties. It was the following year that frontman James Hetfield had some harsh words for frontman Axl Rose during an interview with Rolling Stone magazine, and it was something that the Guns N' Roses frontman got wind of. It was during a show in Sacramento that Rose dedicated the song Double Talk and Jive to James and Lars, as you can see here. We used to like to think that we were homeboys or something. We'll talk about maybe your good friends, I don't know, Metallica for a minute. Let me tell you a couple of things about Metallica. First off, they do a lot of bitching for a band who got paid about 20-30% more than what they deserved at a show because they didn't bring that much. Ooh, Axel's talking now. Well, listen to that. He's, who's he think he is? 
tell you who I think I am. I thought I was friends with these people. You know, I don't know how long they were on the road, but there was nobody in their crew that had ever got a bonus or paid anything extra for working their ass off and slaving for that man. I pretty much watched a lot of people get treated like shit and it wasn't very enjoyable. Mars don't give a shit. calls me at four in the morning trying to kiss my ass and stuff. It's like, but I can't trust him. Because he's going to take it and figure out where to go make some more money. Like the time that we sat around writing a video for Don't Cry and we talked about being underwater and showing all these things and then Lars went home and writes a video. And the cool thing about it is he caught to it. Yeah, I was ripping you guys off. Metallica's video for their single Nothing Else Matters off their 1991 self-titled album would see Lars throwing darts at a poster of Kip Winger. Winger up until this point hadn't said anything about Metallica in the press, but the move took the group's frontman by surprise when he told Julia Bueno in 2019, I never met Metallica, I've never met them to this day, I have no idea why that was happening, none whatsoever. It just kind of immature to put down other musicians and stuff like that. I think they were just on a high that they were the biggest band at the time, and he had something against me. I have no idea really. That would be a question for him. Metallica's 80s era producer Fleming Rasmussen would speak with Metal Hammer looking back at the group's second album, Ride the Lightning. The producer would complain that when he first met Ulrich, he couldn't keep a steady beat, telling the publication, I thought he was absolutely useless. The very first thing I asked when he started playing was, does everything start on an upbeat? And he went, what's an upbeat? We started telling him about beats. They would have to be an equal length of time between that hit, that hit, and that hit, and you have to be able to count to four before you come in again. Then he could play a really good fill that nobody else thought of doing at the time. Metallica alienated a lot of its fans with their anti-Napster crusade in the early 2000s. Appearing on Dennis Miller's show, Foo Fighters frontman Dave Grohl, who supported Napster, criticized Metallica as he stated here. I thought that Lars guy was taking a big dangerous step. Now you gotta admire him for following his, his heart, but well, you it's know a what? pretty dangerous step to disconnect from those kids. I think that the thing about music is that music... Being in a band together for 40 years will of course result in some tense times amongst bandmates. But perhaps one of the most revealing interviews the members of Metallica gave was to Playboy magazine in 2001. It was a tumultuous time for the band as James was about to enter rehab and bassist Jason Newstead left the group. The magazine asked James what he thought of Lars when he met him and he would say, Lars had a pretty crappy drum kit with one cymbal, kept falling over and we'd have to stop, and he'd pick the expletive thing up. He really was not a good drummer, to this day he's not the drummer of the year, we all know that. When we were done jamming it was what the F was that? Three years later the band released their documentary Some Kind of Monster. There's one scene where Lars swears in James' face out of frustration. And leading to the scene was that Hetfield had returned from rehab and had new rules in which the band could record under. The band's therapist in the film would tell Metal Hammer, these guys are waiting for James, waiting, 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 not only waiting, but wondering whether James was ever going to come back. They were scared it was over. And when James comes marching back and says, I can't work between certain hours and certain hours, Lars was really pissed off, like what the F? We've been waiting for you and you've controlled us for 10 months. And he probably felt that James had controlled them for more than 10 months, right? So this was a collision of years of frustration. Fast forward to 2016, Metallica released their latest record, Hardwired to Self-Destruct. While the album was successful, the recording of the record had a few bumps, with Ulrich and Hetfield not talking for a week. James would tell Metal Hammer, we were in the studio and it was like, hey, I'm the guitar player. I like this guitar part, I wanna play it. He'd be like, this part is better. And I was like, since when are you the riff police? So at that point it was, okay, I'm done for now, I have to leave, but a week later we were talking again. Eagles of Death Metal, Jesse Hughes spoke to the Montreal Mirror, telling them two of the biggest people in the music industry he couldn't stand, one of which was former tour mate Axl Rose, and the other being Lars Ulrich, revealing, Lars from Metallica is somebody who just really gets my gander up. You can tell the other guys in the band are cool. On the other hand, you have Lars, who's just a swishy Mary who grew his hair long, put on a denim jacket, and infiltrated this cool gang. The only time I met him, he was wearing a golf pants suit, and everybody was wondering who this fat golfer dude was. He could have been the greatest, but I went up to him after I figured out who he was and told him how much I love Metallica, and he just looked through me and walked away. 30 minutes later, Josh Homme introduced me as a dude from the band, and he didn't even remember me from a half hour before and went on about how he thought we were rad. One of the longest feuds Ulrich has been involved in has been with former guitar player Dave Mustaine, who is the original guitarist for Metallica. He would be fired due to his erratic and drunken behavior in the early 80s. He would agree to appear in the band's film Some Kind of Monster, 
and in one scene Mustaine sits with Lars and discusses how despite all his success with his own band Megadeth, he'll always live in the shadow of Metallica. It was after the documentary was released Mustaine would slam the editing, claiming, and I quote, If you watch the stuff linearly, it's totally different. They filmed three hours of us together, and they only used about five minutes. Why didn't they use the part where Lars gets up and walks into the bathroom crying because I let him have his, because of the exploit of that happened? Mustaine agreed to sign a release provided he was able to okay the final product, something the filmmaker sent him. But the Megadeth leader expressed his disappointment in some of the editing, but the film was released anyway, and it would soon become a story of he said, she said between Mustaine, Ulrich, and the filmmakers. Then in 2018, as Metallica were re-releasing their old recordings under their blackened label, their 1982 demo, No Life to Leather, seemed noticeably absent. Mustaine would write on Twitter that he was holding up its release, saying, and I quote, The talks broke down because Lars wanted credit on two songs I wrote every note and every word to. I have the text, I pass. He would add in a separate interview with Billboard, I don't think that's going to happen. We talked about it a little bit, and there's certain things about the way Lars wants things to go down, and it's not going to happen. They want to say things happen one way, and it didn't happen that way. I can't go along with that. I can't fabricate stuff. That does it for today's video, guys. Thanks for watching. Be sure to hit the like button and subscribe. We'll see you again. Rock and roll through stories. Take care.